just, I guess basically want, just wanting to, to, to thank everybody for taking the time to create this even during the pandemic. Um, and what we know is that there are multiple interlocking pandemics that we are facing, you know, and in a certain sense, this great pause and maybe also a great reckoning, right, that's coming up in the wake of some of the revelations about um, disproportionate impact, the, the systemic racism and other xenophobia, other patterns and, and um, systems through which people are othered and rendered vulnerable. You all were just speaking about the hostile environment created uh, in the UK by the government uh, and the wind rush uh, terror, frankly, campaign, it seems to me. You all were just speaking about um, the, the burning, uh, the, the building that burned on and, and all of these different examples, really, signs, if you will, um, almost cosmic level signs of the, the, the pandemic nature of racism and othering. So this is one, this is a pandemic that's, in, of course, here in the U.S., we've got all of these police whoo, killings and other, other signs, symbols of the pandemic. So if we pause, we know we're, we're constantly surrounded. We've been in that pandemic of racism and othering and you know, differential vulnerability for a long time. And so it intersects with the, the, all the vulnerabilities that are coming up because of coronavirus. So uh, I'd like us to um, pause together because whenever we come together, to me, it's a very sacred thing. And you all have been together to some degree already, and I'm just joining. And so um, just to kind of mark this, because whenever human beings come, it's a, to me a, you know, it's un, these are unrepeatable moments. This is now, you know, this is, this is now our community that I feel honored to be joining with you. So if we can, in a real way, who allow ourselves to settle into what we know about how it is that we tend to ourselves and recognize the sacred, if you will, in our own being and bodies. And sense into how we can extend that to each other in a very conscious way in this moment as we transition from the conversation and the practice that you all were having into this conversation. So I, um, I have a bell, you, do, you all know. Mindfulness is one of my main practices, but I will say I was raised in a household of um, folks who have that heritage in slavery in the United States, right? So my, my family was raised um, in the South. You know, I was born in the South. Um, and we were born into that caste-like system of oppression in the United States that's, that's about the U.S. particular brand of racism. And we had, for generations, relied on a certain kind of spiritually infused, um, hope-infused prophetic Christianity, like a kind of interpretation of the teachings that had been allowed to be presented to the formerly enslaved, the enslaved and formerly enslaved. So I'm just naming that my, the heritages that I bring are um, multiple. They're multiple strains of lineage that come together, as I'm sure is true for really all of us in some way or another, right? Notions of some kind of purity around that are themselves the legacies of oppression. We're all in a certain kind of way. Yes, we come into this conversation from beautiful, unique histories, cultures, distinct heritages, and at the same time, look at this, look at us. Just take a moment if you can to look at these faces arrayed here in these tiles and see, see this human family, this close, close family. 
So if we can just pause for a second, if you'll pause the chat just for a bit, we're really trying to, we'll get back into the chat. I know how lively and beautiful that can be. But I'm asking us to pause just for a moment and really be here. If you're willing to reveal your video, I understand there are many reasons why video is not an option or desirable for everybody. But if you are willing um, and you have your video um, shielded, but if you can let us see your faces right now, it matters to all of us that you're here. Great, wonderful. It matters to all of us that you're here and that every single one of us is here together. This is important. This itself is, well, let's see what it feels like. To, see what it, see how it lands in your body to take a moment to look into each other's faces and to breathe together. So I am gonna go ahead and ring a bell. Of course, we know we don't need bells. We got an inner bell that we can ring anytime we really want to kind of bring ourselves into a deeper presence with what's going on. But just to bring in a particular implement that is a kind of support for centering that um, the lineage of uh, Zen trained teachers who have been part of my heritage and part of that are, you know, found, form part of the foundation of my work. Teachers who um, have studied uh, Zen Buddhism and other forms of Buddhism, but really one of my main teachers is named Norman Fisher, and he's written and done a lot of teaching and a lot of work to support people bringing mindfulness into the world. He has something called the Everyday Mindfulness, um, Everyday Zen Foundation. So he's been trying to really support people like me, law professors, judges, and just many different types of people who are engaged in the world to bring the principles and practices and wisdom of um, a kind of translation of Buddhism into the world. So I'm drawing on that. I'm gonna ring this bell. I'm drawing on that. I'm drawing on my grandmother, Nanny Suggs. Some of you know I talk about my grandmother as my first teacher. She was a woman who, uh, whose grandmother herself was enslaved, right? So having held my grandmother's hand is to have held the hand of someone who had held the hand, right? Of someone who is an enslaved African-American. So that lineage is not so far back. We all know this. And I'm drawing on it here. Drawing on all of these strains. And so I want to invite you to really sit, take a moment, pause, check in with yourself, sense into the lineages and heritages that are alive in you, that helped you come into this space today. And so when I ring this bell, let's allow a deepening of that being with our fullness and who we are. And I'll lightly guide us together here. So really feeling the sacred, mm, tenderness of your own heart, your own spirit. Sensing into the body as you enter into this practice at this moment feeling, if you will, the different points of contact between the body and this earth. 
So it might be the feet on the ground that is a point of attention in this moment, or it could be the point of contact between the buttocks and the chair, some particular place where you can feel who, that the body is being held in this moment. held by this earth as all human beings everywhere who have ever lived have been so held. You know, as we breathe in and out, centering into this body, in this moment, on this earth, this earth that we're sharing, wherever we are, from all around the globe in this moment, across the miles, we're here now, coming home to this moment together. In a sense, we're always together, but coming home now to knowing our togetherness. taking a few deeper than usual breaths. Ah, just to allow ah, the body to really come home <clears throat> in your own way. <clears throat> Gently sensing the breathing, ah, the way in which the body for as long as we are alive, is supporting us with this beautiful, gentle in-breath and out-breath. And again, some of us may be experiencing some difficulty with breathing, as happens sometimes, so I don't want to suggest that this is equally supportive and easeful for everyone. Each of us is unique here. So just as you can and just as you are, feeling your breathing body in this moment and extending as much appreciation and love as we can right here right now starting with ourselves if as is true for me there's any way in which you can feel some of the reverberations of the suffering of this time and this moment what you're going through some part of you that where you're feeling distress or illness as you breathe in and out certainly feel free to place a hand maybe both hands as i'm doing now over my heart place a hand where in the body it might feel supportive for you in this moment just to be with yourself in this new biologically profound way. Our hands, think of all the ways that placing a hand on the shoulder of another or in the hand of another has been a support for your and for other people's journeys. We can support ourselves just in that way. So whether hand on the heart or around the shoulders, as my students sometimes say, it's like giving ourselves a hug. Especially if we're feeling any you know, particular strong triggering of trauma or pain, sometimes just to kind of hold ourselves and remind ourselves, this is the container of our body that we are here to honor first and foremost. Honor this, take care of this body and this being in this moment. So breathing in and breathing out with the intentionality of self-care nurturing, being, grounding in your in the belonging of your body and your breath in this moment, this space, sensing the way that being held here, the scientists call it gravity, this energy by which the, this earth this body, this system, if you will, the body being held is, in a certain sense, 
not so separate, actually. So breathing into a deeper sense of belonging. Everybody belongs here, or else life wouldn't have called for us. We all belong here, on this planet, in this time. So opening up to love in the heart, sensing the quality of the heart in this moment, any way in which it's difficult to bring love right in right now, might not be easy. It can be easier sometimes to imagine a benefactor or somebody else, a friend, somebody you know to be suffering right now, they, you can kind of eat more easily offer love in their direction in this moment. So if it's easier for you to offer your loving heart outwardly in this moment, do that. And if you've been able to offer some sense of love to yourself, see if when you're ready, you can expand the offering to include those in whose name you've gathered, those who you know to be suffering in ways maybe more than ourselves right now. So in this practice, we're breathing in and sensing our own belonging and then sensing our belonging with others. Our awareness of the suffering, not only of ourselves, but of so many at this time. And as we breathe in, sensing into what is well and strong and healing in some way within us, we can breathe out the wish for wellness strengthening healing for everyone right now who's suffering. Extending to the field of energy to our left, as, as far as we can imagine to the left of our body and being right now, encircling the globe, coming back around to the right of the body and being. Imagine extending this wish for well-being outwardly from the heart, the front of the body, wherever you're feeling a sense of your strength and warmth. Imagine all the energy of your loving being expanding outward, forward facing, extending far around, encircling the globe, coming back through the, the energy at your rear, really encircling you in this warm, caring, expression, but not only us expanding all the way on the, around the world, touching all of us in this close circle of family, but extending to the entire human circle of family, if we can imagine that. Now just letting the imagery of that dissolve and if you're willing, just gently breathing and sitting in this moment. And now as we begin to bring this meditation to a close, see if you can identify some way in which the body is amplifying some of the good that you are experiencing in this moment. Some way in which you can feel an awareness of the kind of positive, nurturing, your original medicine for this moment and this time. What is that? What is that like right now? offering your original medicine here to yourself and sensing into how you might offer it more richly on this day to those around you in the work, <clears throat> the work that you may do. <clears throat> and from this place into this conversation we may have together, what is your intention 
for being and being in a way that is an offering, trusting that perhaps that's what life called you here to do, to be, to share. close with these words of, in the spirit of what's called a loving kindness meditation of blessing. And as I speak them, sense into what words of similar offering might be arising in your own heart and then allow those words to reverberate inside silently and offer them in the way that feels right for you. May, may we each and all be filled with loving kindness. May we be well in body and in mind. May you and may we each and all be safe from inner and outer dangers. May our grief be held with love. May we know joy even in our moments of sorrow, know our capacity to feel joy is still here. May we, as we breathe in and out, knowing our belonging here, be truly nurtured, resourced, liberated, easeful, connected, and free. So good moment to you where you are in this, this uh, this experience we call we call life. So wherever you are, I want to say greetings from San Francisco, where it's morning. <clears throat> I want to say uh, I greet you with a sense of your awareness of um, the preciousness of your life. Yeah, please feel free now if you want to populate the greetings in the chat with where you are so we know just where we are in this moment, this particular unrepeatable um, gathering. Because we might come together again, but it'll never be quite just like this. So um, <clears throat> just honoring your spirits. Again, I was able to hear a bit of the preceding conversation and I know that <clears throat> there was so much being pointed to. I say much power. Greetings from the Netherlands, Colorado, Mexico, London. Lancaster, <clears throat> Lancashire, UK, Lee, 
Cardin. Beautiful. Ah, North Carolina, my home state. Greetings, greetings, Yorkshire. So we're sensing this beautiful international community. Isn't that beautiful? Just to pause and again, recognize that we're here from, oh, Denver, Southwest by the sea, UK by the sea, London Bridge, who the Buddhist monastery, I'm a, I'm a, I can't pronounce this, Amaravati in uh, the UK. Coastal Salish Seas, Northwest Washington, homeland of the peoples of the Coastal Salish Seas. Toronto, Canada, East Bay, California, yes. So let's keep populating that in the chat. And as we do so, <clears throat> again, feel this global community. Feel the energy of the power of it. Your power, our power in this body. However, you know, whatever state we're in of healing, right? The perfect imperfection that got you here. Feel it, feel the power of that. And now feel the power huh, of this, this knowing that we're together, the power with. So much of uh, the legacies of our oppressive cultures, wherever they are, and we know there's a lot of you know oppressive culture to go around all around the globe. Actually, it looks different in different places, but these patterns of power over in group, out group, privileging some in, at, at the expense of often the many, right? Like these patterns are everywhere. So in, as we sit here, I want us to sense another kind of power that is often not part of the narrative, but we know in our body and bones, that's power with. Power with, that's the power that's been going to the street and saying, absolutely, we need some changes around here. That's the power that's saying, oh, we need to take care of each other in a moment of pandemic. We can do that. We can notice how we engage, encounter, take care, wear masks, wash our hands more. We can notice who's suffering and try to provide shelter, food, health care. Power with, that's power with. Ha, power with is what brought us together in this circle. In a certain sense, it's the only thing that's ever healed and ever changed anything for the good. I think if you look at history, I'm a student of history. I'm a lifelong student. I hope I will be for the rest of my life learning. But there is, uh, in a certain sense, I think this moment that we're in, I call it, I mean, I don't know what to call this time. I was calling it a pa the pause, the great pause, right? When that was the dominant dynamic of the pandemic. Now it feels to me like the great reckoning and I hope it will be great and I hope it will be a reckoning, right? That's coming forth from the kind of, you know, the sort of upsurge of I think it's part of the sense of vulnerability that we're all feeling because of the pandemic and really feeling like the whole planet is in a certain way is awake to our um, radical, yeah, vulnerability. We never know when something's going to happen. None of us does. That's going to rock our world. Now we're seeing that that can happen. It can rock all of us at once. The vulnerability is linked then with this awareness of interdependence. Right? No, no, none of us is ever alone, actually. But there's some, but that, let's just pause, full stop. Even as we're sheltering in ways that feel alone, we are not. I mean, unless we have somehow found our way to, well, let's just say, remember, we came into this planet, into this body through one woman with the support of one man, we wouldn't be here. Right? We're born in some kind of connected relationship. Even if that was a difficult one for us, I'm not Pollyanna, I'm not saying, you know, all our families of origin were in like places, right? Where we feel safe and nurtured. 
but just a name that, you know, to be human is to come in and through relationship. And we are always in relationship, whether we're conscious of it, whether we feel it as a support or not. But just to breathe, to use language that we didn't create, to read, to be nurtured by the teachings of others. That's a manifestation of us always being in relationship and we're always giving to others, whether we realize it or not by our being here together. And so when we make more conscious the ways that we interconnect, I think there's a power new in nature every time it arises. And it's this new power of the, the current awakening to our interconnected ability to make a change that I think is really important to name here. So we're aware of this radical vulnerability, this radical interdependence, and um, obviously radical impermanence. Right? Anything could change in a moment. So in that, in, in all of those things, there can be a lot of fear. Right? And a lot of also grief because we're losing things and, you know, you know what I mean by grief. So I, I, when I name all of these things, I want to name that I know it's not easy to be going through these things. And I want to say that, you know, there also are these opportunities. Look, we're together in this way. There are these opportunities. There are these green shoots of possibility for waking us up and remaking the world that was not working well for most people the old way. So that holding like, you know, the possibility, but also recognizing that these, all of these things on dynamics I'm naming also quite predictably a, a raise up or a, a touch into invoke a kind of often a, a triggering of trauma, right? Of like these patterns of fear and what's going to happen to me and my folk reactivity is what we sometimes call it in the mindfulness and buddhist world a lot of reactivity fear anger fragility like i can't handle this they we in the u.s we use this language of white fragility and i guess that's becoming more than the international conversation about how patterns of dominance create a certain kind of hyper fragile resistance when someone says hey wait a minute that dominant way is not the only way and it's hurting us right that reactivity of like i don't want to hear that i want to deny that anybody is suffering here in the u.s um this scholar and teacher robin d'angelo has named that reactivity white fragility but actually there's a lot of different kinds of fragilities that are like these embedded ways that when we are part of the culture of dominance we just resist being called out and being reminded that you know they're suffering here. So fragility though is real. It's a kind of a dynamic that is being uh, coming up in, in this time too. I'll just say you all know, for me, mindfulness practices are what are helping me to move through all of these different multiple intersecting realities. You know, I don't think, it, and mindfulness wasn't offered originally in the West as this robust socially engaged support for changing the world, for helping those who have been marginalized to thrive. But that's how I, it's how it always has felt for me. So, you know, in my work, I talk about grounding in a sense of our being, you know, selected for by life, our inherent belonging. I named that a bit in the meditation. Grounding in the book I wrote, that's the first part of the book that we have to ground in a sense of our belonging. Grounding um, and, and seeing what there is to be seen from that place of groundedness. It's hard to take stuff in if we're not grounded. You know this. So grounding, then practicing, turning toward as opposed to turning away. And having, again, the stamina, the agility as opposed to fragility right? Emotional agility. Like I can, who I can move into recognizing sorrow and pain, but also not necessarily get stuck in that agility, agile. I can move into 
what else is here? I can expand the aperture. I can see this suffering and see everything else. Mm, the great field of powerful awakening that's happening, even as we notice the suffering. The love that's coming in to say no more to that. So grounding, seeing more fully, being with what we see with more, again, stamina, steadfastness, capacity to, uh, in mindfulness, we use the phrase equanimity, flow with, be with. Grounding, thank you, Alex, so much. Grounding, seeing, being with these multiple complex realities. No one story, beautiful teaching that we're hearing. Mm, the danger of a single story. Somebody please put a link to that beautiful teaching um, by the sister from, is it Nigeria, the writer, right? The day, if you could put her name in that link to her teaching on that, uh, talk she's done so beautifully a few years, some years ago now, but I, it resonates still. The danger of a single story. We all know we're tempted to have a single story about what's happening. A story of me, my, my people. If, we, if expanded at all, it's like, you know, we got some select others that we might hold. And I, uh, I smile when I say that because I hear myself in that. You know what I'm saying? We all, we all do this. And, and, the beautiful and, we're waking up to the danger of whatever single story there is, whether it's about that other who's taken the jobs and whatever, you know, or that other who is the oppressor. Hello, I'm gonna have to say this. We all are tempted into a single story. Multiple complex realities though are intersecting and are, you know, making themselves known. And so these practices can help us with, again, shifting almost in a, in a who We don't often name this aspect. We're doing it all the time, but we don't have words really for how complex it is to live in these bodies in these times, especially, I mean, look, right now we're gathered using this technology through which we can learn at a moment's notice what it's like right now across the globe, we can open it up. Google Earth will show us a literal video, visual, of what it's like where you are right now. We didn't have this before. I didn't grow, my generation, I'm 52 years old on this planet, 52 years on this planet and this life and this incarnation. Most of that, we didn't have this ability to pick up a device and learn everything that's ever been known to you. Yeah, and share the things, right, that we've been privileged to learn. And then make them available. We're, we're gifted in, a, in ways that are profound, even though there's so much suffering still happening. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That there's both and all the time. Multiple complex truths. Gifted right now. Each of us to be alive right now. And also a lot of suffering. Tremendous legacies of So much what I so much injustice. So much injustice. So grounding, seeing, being with, right, being able to be with this and recognizing it looks and feels differently for all of us all the time. Right? So creating that spacious capacity in our heart to let your experience be what it is and not have it have to be mine. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? How it is that we need to be together in ways that can create space for what is true for you that might be different from, from what's true for me. So that um, I talk in the book about rotating the center of our concern, if you will. You know, in, in identity politics, that's a, a word or term that's used to help us name how we might stand up and say, yeah, everybody's got a story, but right now I need to talk about what's happening to black men in America. Or right now I need to talk about what's happened to the Wimbrush generation. Or right now I need to talk about what's happening to immigrants in, in, in India. Or, you know, uh, what's happening in, in um, Sri Lanka or wherever we might be. Right, and maybe feeling the pain of this moment. China, right? 
wherever it is, we might have to say, look, yes, we're all one human family and this part is suffering. I'm raising that part of right now. And so that ability when we come together like this to, mm, to say, I need to speak about this part of the suffering and I need y'all to hear me. In the book, I talk about that as um, deepening the capacity to, to claim the center, first of all, to say, I'm going to step into the center and, and speak for what's happening to black people in this country right now for example. I'm going to speak to what's happening to indigenous people in this country right now or whatever, wherever it is, right? Claiming the center, that's important. And our practices can help us do that and know that our voice matters. Also though, when we come together to build coalitions and to build this, 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 the awareness of the shape of the cloth, that's a phrase I use sometimes for what it is, to deepen the sense of like, we're in it together. We need to be able to not just claim the center, right, and be constantly elbowing each other out of the center, but like create in some way this ability that I think we're doing right here with, in a way we're manifesting this um, through the structure that William and others have created for this uh, international meditation retreat. We're rotating the center. We're, you claim it, but then we rotate it, pivot. All right, who else has the voice? Pass the talking stick pass the mic and let's turn toward that group, that representatives sharing and suffering. Does that make sense? So rotating the center, both claiming and then rotating the center. Not, it doesn't always have to be about my story, but it sometimes will be. So let me just pause, there's so many, right? So as you all know, again, that grounding being, grounding, seeing, being, doing, doing justice, hello taking action for justice, not only for ourselves. These practices are not just about centering and healing. Very, very important. The first approximation to what justice is for me. Justice begins right here with giving myself this precious elixir of water without which we wouldn't be here. This is the only drink we really need. We sometimes forget this. First approximation to justice, taking care of the body and being, right? And then how are we with each other? Second approximation, how can I be with you, right? How can I honor you and myself at the same time? And from that place, I'm, I'm honoring myself, I'm taking care, I'm t trying to be there for you and for my loved ones right near me. Beautiful teachings in our traditions about that. We don't leave somebody sick in the household, we don't go out to take care of others. Take care of the sick person right here, right now, in the family, in the community. And, and, and also keep expanding out, working together collaboratively to change these systems. Justice in every, like these dimensions, if you will, personal, interpersonal, and then systemic collectively, always happening all the time. Don't forget the justice for the self though. You deserve this. You have to start there. You will quickly burn out if you're not starting there every day. So grounding, seeing, being, doing, and through all of this liberating, freeing ourselves so that we're not getting stuck in the agenda that we think has to be the thing we do. Yes, do it from this place of loving ability to keep doing it. And I'm going to close by reference to my grandmother again. My grandmother, born in 1906, a child of segregation, the legacies of slavery. She was not allowed to go to, to formal school past like the age of seven or eight in any kind of consistent way. She had to struggle to kind of teach herself to read. She never read very well because of this. This is my grandmother. So when I was a little girl, seeing her, she was still cleaning houses for other people in the United States in that southern part of the world. Not unlike so many of our mothers and um, relatives, wherever they are, are still relegated to these kinds of service positions and treated as if that's all they're ever good for. These patterns are still with us. And we know something about them. So when we turn toward the liberated work, we want to be liberating, obviously, not only for ourselves. That's why we're here. But my grandmother taught me 
to get up, center our, herself. She got up before dawn every day, did a centering prayer practice. Got up, took care of us, fed us, cooked for us, and then went out and cleaned houses. So her message, the message that I learned from her, watching her is, and she did this even in a way that allowed her to see her own value, her worth, to have a sense of warmth in her heart, not bitterness, because I think she could see the bigger picture that her value, her life still mattered. She was still able to teach. She was a teacher. She had been called to the ministry. We took cakes and food to people over the weekends. We didn't have a lot, but we fed people. Do you all know what I'm saying? Like this ability to move through in times of suffering is something we know something about. And we are here to draw on the history of our personal lineages and ancestors. The women, the grandmothers, the grandfathers, the men, the people of all different backgrounds and, and genders and no genders that we know have taught us how to thrive in difficult times. All of those are the teachings of engaged mindfulness for me. So I am going to stop there and see if there are any questions, reflections, anything resonating with you. Can I speak? Yes, please. Um, oh gosh, I've cried not more than once uh, throughout the time that you've been speaking. And I, I don't really have a question, but just to say thank you so much. And every time you spoke about your grandmother, I just felt such emotion for this woman. You know, I, I, I felt for her fragility, but I feel for her, I feel her strength as well. And actually her, her strength in her fragility. Um, I just... She feels powerful, <laughs> just incredible. No, just thank you. Thank you so much. And my dear, when you say that, really I'm hearing all of the grandmothers, you know what I'm saying? What we're talking absolutely. about, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Power in that vulnerability. Someone made, someone made that talk famous in the United States, a, a talk called The Power of Vulnerability, a book called The Power of Vulnerability. And I'm going to say that someone, if you read it carefully as I have, and you read her footnotes, she drew on the stories of who? Black, black and brown women of color in the United States, Brene Brown. Her research, she will tell you if you read the footnotes. Disproportionately, the people who taught her how to have power in vulnerability and fragility were women of color in the United States. And so this is not to say only women of color know something about the power of vulnerability, but it is to say that we know the marginalized everywhere. Yeah, it's a familiar story. The marginalized everywhere know something and offer and teach the world. And I'm just amplifying the power of each of you, each of you, in wherever you are. Raise up the voices of the marginalized. They are the ones who will help us through this moment, this reckoning. And raise up the marginalized voice within you because there is deep power in that. All of us, I thank you for amplifying the gender piece of this. Again, to me, that's that river and the ocean of all of us, right? The river that I'm swimming in is this cisgendered female body. And I, you know, I want to name, you're right. There's so many. I mean, I have to just, I'm going to say it. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of abuse, actually. <clears throat> where because I'm, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is starting to show this. <clears throat> I'm <clears throat> leaning into y'all for support right now. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. For your book because it really helped me in this period because um, I saw it as a um, an opportunity to dig into the strength of, of those who came before me and uh, the uh, strength of those who gave, engaged in the civil rights movement and the training in nonviolent passive resistance um, and I've since started the book club and shared it with others and 
I can't wait to track you down in uh, San Francisco to engage in your training. So, um, and I wrote, I wrote something on your website about how the book impacted me. So I hope you'll read it. Thank and you, I'm looking dear. forward to meeting you one day. Ah, honored, honored. Thank you, my dear. Only time and who can say